Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome today for our discussion on permits, licenses, and the administrative state. My name is Adam White. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of the Administrative State here at George Mason University's Anson and Scalia Law School. It's my great, my great pleasure to welcome you all today. Now, so much of the study of administrative law, uh, including in my own class, tends to focus first and foremost on agencies' rulemaking power, power to make and rescind regulations. But of course, that's only a small part of what agencies do. And in some ways, the most consequential work of an agency is its power to grant or to deny licenses to private se sector actors uh, seeking to engage in economic activity. So we thought we would dedicate an entire workshop and now conference to this subject to explore various aspects of agencies' power to grant or deny licenses. And as you'll see through the course of today, underneath that umbrella topic of permits and licenses, we have four very interesting panels, each one centered around new legal scholarship that one of the panelists has produced on that specific aspect of the licensing power. Uh, later in the day, we'll hear about the FDA, about energy infrastructure, about banking charters, and fintech. But we thought we'd start the day with a much broader discussion of what our author has defined as marketable permits. I'll leave uh, Judge Williams to introduce the, uh, the subject matter of the panel, but it's my pleasure to, to uh, introduce the speakers. Our first speaker today will be Jason Schwartz. Jason is the legal director for New York University's Institute for Policy Integrity. He's also an adjunct professor and resident scholar at, NYU, at uh, NYU's School of Law. He also runs the school's advanced regulatory policy clinic. Uh, his work at, at Policy Integrity focuses on climate change, but he also focuses more broadly on administrative law and regulation. He's worked as a consultant for the Administrative Conference of the United States, but I highly encourage you to take a look at all of his research. The work they do at Policy Integrity uh, is fascinating and very important. Our second speaker today will be Kerry Coglianis. Kerry is the Edward B. Schills Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. He also directs uh, Penn Law School's Penn Program on Regulation, which publishes uh, Reg Review, a, high, a website I highly recommend for updates and current affairs on regulation. Our third speaker today is Noga Morag Levine, a Professor of Law and the George Rumel Faculty Scholar at Michigan State University's College of Law. Her scholarship combines a focus on environmental law and legal history, and we're very pleased that she could join us today to bring this added perspective of legal history to today's conversation. And the fourth, uh, fourth panelist will be Thomas Hazlitt, the H. H. McCauley Endowed Professor of Economics at Clemson University's College of Business. Professor Hazlitt writes widely on the political economy of regulation, uh, especially, uh, or most recently in his new book, The Political Spectrum, A History of the FCC's Regulation of the Radio Spectrum. Uh, today's visit is for him a homecoming of sorts after a long career at, the, uh, at George Mason University's Department of Economics. And so it's my great pleasure to welcome him back to Arlington. Uh, finally, today's discussion will be led by Judge Stephen Williams. Judge Williams was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit by President Reagan in 1986. He still serves on that court, now as a senior judge. Judge Williams' interests famously range widely. In recent years, he's authored two significant works of history on liberal reformers amidst the Russian Revolution. But he is perhaps best uh, known for his particular focus on law and political economy of regulation and public administration. And so we could think of no one better to lead today's first discussion. So please join me in welcoming the panel and Judge Stephen Williams. Uh, contrary to what Adam said, I'm not really gonna introduce the subject, which I think you all have a, a good idea of its general scope. Uh, I will have a few reflections on it uh, after the speakers have completed their talks, which are limited to 10 minutes. Uh, and first, Professor Schwartz. Sure, and I'll do my best to stick to that 10 minutes. I'm going to move over here just so I can see my own slides. Um, so I'm going to start talking about marketable permits by sort of not talking about them and talking about uh, an area of regulation where 
there aren't currently marketable permits um, and taking a look at how industry um, has reacted to, to the idea of them. Um, so the Department of Energy sets efficiency standards um, for over 60 different categories of residential, commercial, and industrial appliances. Um, this covers 90% of, of home energy use, um, things like washers and dryers, 60% um, of commercial, 30% of industrial energy use, air compressors, um, lighting. Um, and the program is, is by all counts a, a huge success. It's saved consumers trillions of dollars. Um, how it works right now is uh, each specific type of product gets a particularized standard. Um, there are different standards, for example, for refrigerators that have through the door ice machines versus those that don't have it. So it's that particularized. Um, and there's very particularized testing as well. So um, you might see how much energy a dishwasher uses to clean 10 large dinner plates covered in mashed potatoes. That's a real example of, of, a, of a test that they use. Um, and so each product line, each product has to meet the individual target. Um, in 2017, the Department of Energy put out a request for information that asked, what if we didn't do it that way? What if we added some flexibility? What if we let the market try to more efficiently allocate this responsibility so that manufacturers could find the lowest cost way to hit their efficiency targets? Um, and the Department of Energy said, hey, there's this great program that the Department of Transportation runs. Um, CAFE standards, corporate average fuel economy standards. Um, and under CAFE, each car manufacturer doesn't have to make sure that every single car hits the efficiency um, target. Instead, manufacturers are allowed to make some models that are less efficient, so long as they make other models that are more efficient. Um, and everything averages out um, on a sales-weighted basis. That's called averaging. Um, you, they also have trading, which is where one company um, way over complies. So Tesla, for example, and generates a lot of extra uh, credits, a lot of extra efficiency that they can sell um, and trade to, to another company. Um, and so the Department of Energy said, you know, transportation does this for cars and trucks. What if we did this for uh, appliances and equipment? Or maybe we could do something called a fee bait. Um, some other countries use a fee bait to, to do their vehicle efficiency standards. How a fee bait works is you set a pivot point, which is, is basically a, a standard, a regulatory standard for stringency. Um, and if it, the industry doesn't hit that target, they pay a fine. But if, you, if, a, if a company over complies, then they actually get a rebate um, from, from the government. Um, and in, in briefly in passing, the, uh, the Department of Energy's request for information also mentioned the idea um, of banking. Um, banking is where you over comply in one year um, and save those credits to, to use it in a future year when, when you may not quite hit, hit your target. They didn't spend a lot of time talking about that, but they mentioned that that's also uh, a, a piece of the flexibility that's in the, in the CAFE standards. Um, there were several ideas with market-based compliance flexibilities that the Department of Energy actually didn't talk about. They didn't talk about borrowing, which is sort of the mirror image of, of banking. Um, Borrowing is where you um, miss your target one year, but you say, don't worry, I'll make it up in a future year. Industry historically has loved this idea, um, and the CAFE program does, does have a, a borrowing piece, but for whatever reason, Department of Energy didn't mention that as, as an option. They didn't mention offsets as an idea. This is where um, an unregulated segment of the industry um, can uh, do something to generate credits so that regulated manufacturers um, can buy those credits. Um, so for example, um, there are a lot of appliances that, that aren't covered right now. Um, Set-top cable boxes are a notable example. There's a voluntary standard, um, but you could set up an offset program there. The, the agency kind of hinted at that, but didn't really get into it. Um, they didn't really get into different kinds of allocation methods for some of these marketable permits. Um, the, the idea of, of grandfathering, this is something that existing and large industries have usually really liked about compliance flexibilities. Um, grandfathering is when um, industry is given free allocations based on their historical need, their historical use um, uh, of a resource, um, and then allowed to either hang on to that um, or, or trade it. Um, existing industry tends to really like this. It's, it's sort of a, a free windfall, um, and it also can be used sort of as a barrier to entry because existing industry gets, gets those allocations, 
Um, new industry doesn't. New industry has to wait for existing industry to, to sell to them. Um, and that's, uh, that kind of approach to allocation is, is contrasted with um, more of an open auction. Um, but, but neither of these were, were really a, a addressed um, in the request for information. They focused on um, averaging um, trading and, um, and fee baits. And they said, hey, industry, what do you think about ideas? Industry did not like these ideas, at least according to their public comments. Um, now, granted, public comments may have an element of strategic puffery um, to them. Um, there's an incentive to, um, for industry to position themselves um, you know, publicly so that they can get more from the agency. Um, but as, as we'll see in a minute, in a variety of other contexts and other rulemakings and public comments, industry has actually quite often supported market-based compliance flexibilities. Um, here, they did not. Um, so you had um, sort of the most enthusiastic end of the spectrum, um, Samsung, um, encouraging more exploration of these ideas, um, a little more lukewarm um, reaction from uh, a lighting company called Acuity. Um, Carrier, um, a, a big company, said, we can't imagine how that would possibly work for any of our products, but you could maybe see if other people are interested in it. We're not, but maybe somebody else, sure. Um, but then everybody else pretty much was against this idea. They called it ill-conceived, Ill misguided, burdensome. This included large um, trade associations, large companies like Whirlpool. Um, so this surprised me, at least, um, because there is actually a history of pretty frequent support from industry for market-based uh, approaches. Um, and it makes a certain amount of sense that at least when you have an existing regulatory target, that at least some segments of industry are going to be interested in flexibilities. They're going to be interested in ways to lower their compliance costs to hit that set um, regulatory target. Or maybe they're interested in ways they can structure the program um, that would be useful to them, that would give them a competitive advantage. There are ways you can structure market-based approaches so that they operate more as a, a barrier to entry that can be useful to certain segments of industry. There are ways that you can structure them so that it removes barriers to entry that can be useful to, to smaller, newer companies. Um, so there are a variety of reasons why you might think that industry would be more um, eager. And, and in fact, through history, um, and, and this is not a, a fully comprehensive list. This is sort of what fit on the slide. And it's not important to actually um, see um, or be able to, to, to read, um, because um, I've helpfully color-coded um, some, some slides to just have some things pop out, but um, the list goes you know, from everything back to the 1930s when there was essentially a cap and trade sort of structure set up um, for New York City taxi licenses all the way through to the, the very famous acid rain market in the 1990s um, and to now the, the, the now stalled um, clean power plan for, for greenhouse gas emissions from, from large power plants. Um, and through that history, very often this idea for averaging, banking, trading, offsets, all those sorts of marketable permits and, and flexible structures, um, it has come um, often from, from industry. Um, so going back to the 1970s, um, the idea, oh, two minutes left. Um, there's no way I can get through all this. Um, the idea that, that um, to have averaging within a single plant bubbling so that different sources within the plant, um, you know, it, the plant complies so long as it all averages out. That idea came from the smelting industry. Um, the idea of, of banking and borrowing um, in cafe standards, um, expanding that came from, um, in part, to, to, as an attempt to try to save the American Motors um, Corporation. Um, and even when um, the idea hasn't strictly come from industry, they often still um, support it, up in, including even the clean power plant to, to some extent. Now, industry usually isn't going to want the stringency of the standard to be set by reference to all the cost savings um, that they can maybe get out of, um, uh, out of the compliance flexibilities. They don't want the agencies necessarily to take those cost savings and put that into a more stringent standard. But once the standard has been set, industry is often going to seek um, the most you know, flexible, uh, efficient way um, to get there. Um, so given all that, why, why did the appliance industry uh, object? Um, well, um, a, a few said, there's just no statutory authority for this. It'll create too much uncertainty. It's, it's not legal. Well, it's actually true of, of many programs that they don't have um, statutory authority, or at least they weren't created 
with statutory authority. And then maybe a few years later, Congress would come in and ratify um, that program. Um, it's not clear that the, these are actually, this form of regulation is, is more uncertain than, than other types. And one interesting example comes from um, the South Coast um, Air Quality Management District of California, um, where um, in an early program they had that allowed banking. One year they just announced all of those bank credits that you have industry, we're now going to discount them by 80%. It right? really throws the whole market off. But four years later, um, industry was back at the negotiating table with them arguing for more um, similar types of flexibilities, banking and trading, um, and what became the Reclaim program. Um, so you know, despite all of that uncertainty, um, industry was still really um, interested. Um, the appliance industry raised some other ideas. This is going to be too hard to monitor. We can't possibly track all of all our sales through all of our distribution channels. It just won't work. Well, actually, if you look through history, um, a lot of <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of other programs have, have solved these very similar issues. Um, EPA has um, a, a program that covers um, farm equipment and uh, landscaping uh, appliances, things like leaf blowers. They have very similar distribution channels. Um, they found a, a way to make it work. Um, so what might be um, some other possible reasons? Um, these were sort of hinted at um, in, in the industry comments, but it's not what they focused on. So maybe there were some unstated motivations behind their opposition. Maybe they were worried that creating this new program would take a lot of upfront agency resources, and industry simply had other priorities, other um, deregulatory objectives that they thought they could get out of the agency right now, and they didn't want it, the Department of Energy to focus on marketable permits right now. Um, there could be something between a, um, a domestic um, foreign split with, with um, Samsung um, supporting with, with other companies. I'm not, although, although there are structures um, that wouldn't have, have played to those different advantages, and it's curious why um, industry didn't try to even pursue some of the, those other structures. Um, finally, maybe agent, the industry was worried that all of these cost savings that marketable permits can deliver would eventually feed back in into more stringent standards, and that's really what they were uh, I'm afraid of. That may be, but there are actually a number of cases um, where very explicitly marketable permits um, have increased the stringency of standards. So for that EPA mobile source um, average, uh, averaging banking and trading program, bank credits um, are counted at, at a 20% reduction. It essentially is a way of increasing the stringency um, but even with those things explicitly built in, you continue ha to have industry support in these other areas. So it remains a little bit, there, there, those are some possible explanations, but it remains a little bit of a mystery why industry um, was so universally um, opposed to this I idea. Um, and that, um, unfortunately, is, is beyond the time I, I had. So I, I'm sure you'll get a chance at the question. Uh, gaps. So. Thank you very much, Judge Williams. Thank you, Adam, for the invitation to be here. Thank you for all of you to be here. I'm pleased to, to comment on this uh, terrific and quite extensive study that Jason has, uh, has, has produced and is developing, and I think it's very valuable, and I think that's my bottom line, is that this kind of inquiry, looking uh, after the fact at how any kind of regulation is implemented and what effects it has is absolutely vital. And what I want to share in my opening remarks here are some observations about market-based approaches to regulation that draw on some work that I've been doing uh, lately on performance-based regulation. And uh, I just want to distinguish between regulation that tells regulated entities exactly what to do, what I call means-based regulation, telling companies what means to adopt to achieve some kind of regulatory goal, versus a type of regulation that's ends-based or performance-based that imposes the obligation to achieve or to avoid some kind of uh, stated level of performance. Performance-based regulation is, I want to suggest, the larger category into which most market-based regulatory regimes fit. Uh, much of the work that I've done has focused on what I would call uniform performance 
standards. That is, every facility, every regulated entity has to meet the same level of performance, whereas market approaches that Jason has just talked about are, not, are often non-uniform. They allow for variation, but there's still the need, especially in the environmental context, need for the regulated entity to achieve some specified level of performance, the level of performance that matches whatever credits, offsets, uh, uh, or, or, or permits that the facility holds. This is, uh, both of these approaches are widely lauded. I think they are very useful and uh, they have a tremendous number of advantages to them that Jason, I think, does a really terrific job of outlining in his paper and that others have observed, uh, you know, don't see too many people arguing against uh, regulation that could be a little bit more flexible, that could be more cost effective, that could be performance based. I have been one of the folks who have tried to say, well, let's look at th this approach to regulation realistically, recognizing all of the advantages that it can hold, but also seeing what might be some of its underbelly. And so what I'm gonna talk about, draw on a paper that I've written with Jennifer Nash and published in the Yale Journal on Regulation called The Law of the Test, as well as a paper that appeared in an excellent volume that David Zering and Francesca Bignami have published on comparative approaches to regulation. Um, so, and with that, I wanna just sort of draw out two points about uh, performance-based regulation and then draw out some implications of that for market instruments. The first, it may be the most obvious implication, but it really, I think, bears uh, highlighting the theory of market-based approaches of emissions trading and so forth is that it's possible to achieve more cost-effective regulation. In other words, to achieve the same outcomes as other kinds of regulations, but at a lower cost due to the averaging banking trading elements associated with them. And that's great. There's a huge assumption underlying all of that, and that is that monitoring of compliance can be done accurately and reliably. Uh, the only reason really we were able to move as a country to SO2 emissions trading was because of the development of continuous emissions monitoring devices. And so as we go forward and think about the applications of market-based approaches in other contexts, I just wanna put out there that it's really vital to recognize that it's only gonna work if, if monitoring's reliable. So that's the first point. The second point is that there are some, I think, underappreciated side effects to flexible approaches of regulation. Uh, the flexibility uh, that is afforded regulated entities does permit the achievement of more cost-effective outcomes, but only if my first point holds that we can reliably monitor and ensure that the outcomes are the same, but two, to make sure that other values that society cares about are not compromised in the process of achieving those cost-effective outcomes. And in the realm of performance-based regulation more broadly, there are, I think, sadly, uh, a number of instances in which uh, other values have been overlooked by regulators, at least at the outset of creating a more flexible regulatory strategy. Uh, let me give you two examples from the US and one from overseas. The overseas one comes from New Zealand, which shifted a number of years ago to a performance-based uh, approach to building code regulation. And they said it was fine for companies to depart from what had previously been a very prescriptive building code set of standards to adopt more flexible construction patterns uh, or, and techniques. And as long as they met the basic outcomes that the regulator cared about in the regulations, which was structural integrity. And so hundreds of thousands of building projects went forward under the performance-based approach. And it turned out that builders were able to save costs 
Uh, and they were able to build still buildings that were structurally sound, but what they did was use techniques that ultimately were less effective in uh, preventing the growth of mildew. And New Zealand's a very moist country, and they had a huge public fiscal crisis in having to pay for uh, new housing uh, there the, the, to, to compensate uh, uh, people who had homes that were contaminated by mold and mildew. Uh, a second example from the US comes from uh, the history of child resistant packaging uh, regulation. Back in the 70s, the U.S. went to a performance-based approach. These, you know, the, 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 the medicine bottles that we have a hard time ourselves opening, well, that's exactly what happened. They created an initial standard that said, we don't care how you make your packages, but just set a standard so that it's hard for children to open it. It was also hard, though, for adults to open it. And so adults, once they finally pried it open, tended to leave the the bottles open around their house or put them in other containers. And in fact, we saw an increase in uh, child poisonings. Um, a third example comes from Highway Traffic Safety, uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Airbags, which were initially designed to meet a performance test that would protect a crash test dummy size to the average adult male. Manufacturers built those systems. They protected uh, average adult size male, and, and, they, and they ultimately saved in the aggregate many lives, but they also actually created new risks to shorter statured adults, women, and uh, to children. Uh, eventually, NHTSA created a, a more uh, fine-tuned, smarter standard that took that into account. Eventually, the, the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission developed a multi-part test for child-resistant packaging that said make them child-resistant, but also make them so adults can open them. But we see that there's a possible tendency when we focus on one outcome to miss and overlook the others. Uh, 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 finally, uh, there's another limitation I just want to highlight briefly, and that's sort of a teaching to the test phenomenon, that manufacturers, regulated entities might go ahead and meet those outcomes, but do so in ways that compromise other goals. The VW Volkswagen scandal is one where there might be even some fraud or evasive behavior. Now, fraud, evasive behavior, uh, unintended consequences, those are afflict any kind of regulation. But I think when it comes to thinking about these lessons, some of the underbelly of performance standards for market-based instruments, let me just close by highlighting a, 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 at least four implications to, to worry about. One is the loss of compliance cushions, which Jason mentions that with a lot of uniform standards, everybody is trying to get below that standard. And, they, and we actually have outcomes that in some sense overperform. And to the extent that that's socially uh, beneficial overperformance, and we lose that by a finer grain, more uh, uh, easily calibrated um, market uh, approach. Uh, that's that's a loss. Second uh, implication: think about hot spots. You mentioned it a number of times in your individual case studies, but it's not in the overview of all of the the, the benefits, the theoretical benefits and costs of performance. Standards. Think about trade-offs. The third implication is trade-offs and other values when it comes to energy efficiency standards for appliances. Maybe we also care about how these appliances uh, pre prevent fires or protect consumers from shock. And to the extent that we're optimizing on energy efficiency, maybe there's some trade-offs to worry about there. And finally, think about moral hazard, the equivalent to people taking those child-resistant packages and leaving the lids off might apply in the energy efficiency context as well. If we have more energy efficient dishwashers, do people wash uh, you know, loads of dishes with fewer dishes? Do they leave their refrigerator door open more? Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Adam, for this invitation. Um, and thank you, Jason, for a very informative and thought-provoking paper. And I look forward to hearing uh, all the other papers coming uh, today. Um, Jason's research uh, starts from really from a, an intriguing puzzle. Why would an industry that is currently subject to prescriptive regulation reject even the option of flexibility of tradable credits? And the article then proceeds to examine each of the arguments a compliance industry offered as reasons for opposing the credits, 
against the findings of an impressively large body of work on the performance of marketable permits across multiple policy contexts. From this evidence, the article then concludes that the compliance industry's concerns are generally unfounded and <coughs> hints that industry opposition might be motivated by reasons other than the ones its spokesman articulated. The bottom line reached is that the industry failed to meet its burden of proof, meaning that it failed to show why, in view of the overall success of other permit programs in improving efficiency, it, meaning the appliance industry, presented an exception in this, to this rule. Why assume a default rule under which the burden of proof falls on those who dispute the desirability of marketable permits? One possible line of response is an argument based on, theoretical, on a theoretical axiom on the greater efficiency of market-based instruments over prescriptive regulation. And that argument is indeed influentially present in the legal economic literature. This, however, is not, if I understand it correctly, the argument the article wishes to make. Uh, instead, it seeks to offer an empirical case based on prior experience for the actual greater efficiency of these instruments. And for this purpose, it builds on examples uh, of arguable, arguably successful programs across the sphere. I think this information is very useful as a broad background to the policy question at hand, but the appliance industry's core argument was that its circumstances differed from those that existed within successful programs, such as the acid rain and the wetland program. So evidence based on the success of these and other programs can't answer its concerns. Moreover, unless we treat the superiority of tradable markets as an axiom, it seems reasonable to assume that the efficiency of these markets would vary, in particular due to differences in marginal compliance costs and hence opportunities for trade, as well as differences in transaction costs associated with setting and operating the market. In order to know where along this spectrum appliance markets are likely to fall, we would want to look at the experience gained in as close an economic context as possible. I think the CAFE standards are a good example in, in this response, but I'm not sure whether wetland mitigation uh, speaks, would speak uh, to the concerns um, of the industry. Um, an economist in the Treasury Department, as well as others, have disputed the views of the industry, but preferring the assessment of these experts over the intimate knowledge of the industry leaders seems somewhat paradoxical. is isn't the starting point for incentive-based regulation, the idea that firms understand their cost structure in ways that bureaucrats cannot possibly know. Uh, Kerry already touched on the, uh, the, the hotspots issue. I didn't initially think that this was uh, a concern in the appliance context, but some of the comments did raise it. Uh, differences in the potential of trades to create hotspots are among the most important reasons for case-by-case -case analysis of the benefits and drawbacks of marketable permits. Uh, concerns regarding hotspots are raised in increasingly frequently. Uh, of course, distributive concerns can be mitigated through geographical limitations at times, uh, but only at the cost of decreased opportunities for market participation. Uh, from the perspective of industry, hotspot issues are likely to increase the chance of litigation and, unrelated, and related uncertainty. Uh, as economist Tom Tiedenberg, a founding father of marketable permits, conceded in an article back in 1995, when emission location matters, the dominance of economic <laughs> instruments over traditional command and control strategies is less clear cut in practice and might appear in, see, in theory. Uh, so to summarize my argument so far, I think the empirical evidence necessary for policymakers and industries to make informed choices between regulatory instruments must be closely tailored to the circumstances of the particular industry. Rather than an axiom regarding the inherent superiority of marketable permits, we need an inquiry that allows us to discern where and when marketable permits are likely to outperform prescriptive regulation and where the opposite might be true. In the rem remainder of my time, I'd like to take the search for lessons from history regarding the future of tradable permits in a somewhat different direction. The research on the presumed superiority of marketable permits has only in part been based on cost savings and related economic efficiency arguments. No less important have been arguments rooted in normative political theory. The view in a nutshell is of direct permit-based uniform regulation 
as somehow illegitimate and un-American. It is a sentiment shared by conservatives and liberals within the legal academy. The argument made its appearance in a series of articles written during the later 1970s and early 80s and criticism of the technology-based regulatory regimes enacted under the Clean Water Act and to a lesser extent the Clean Air Act. A prominent example is Bruce Ackerman's and Richard Stewart's article, Reforming Environmental Law, the Democratic Case for Market Incentives. One indicator of this view is the adoption of the military term command and control as a synonym for direct regulation, a synonym designed to serve as a shorthand critique of the legitimacy of such regulation. In a 1986 article, Richard Stewart commented favorably on this semantic turn when he wrote, for good reason, the prevailing federal system of regulation is widely referred to as command and control regulation, an epithet that reflects the normative depreciation that infects this form of regulation. Two years later, he described the same regulatory system as nothing less than a massive effort at Soviet-style planning of the economy to achieve environmental goals. Echoing Stuart K. Sunstein coined the combined term so Soviet-style command and control regulation. In the political context of the time, there was hardly a clearer way of casting the relevant regulatory practices as un-American. For the origins of these critiques and any lessons to be taken from history, allow me to venture back to the start of the 19th century. I warned Adam about this. The first administrative regime requiring chemical plants to use available pollution control measures as precondition for operating was established, perhaps unsurprisingly, in France under a decree enacted in 1810. I said unsurprisingly in France, what you might find more surprising, however, is to learn that the regime was created by people who were the owners of large chemical plants and with the support of the chemical industry, which gained in the deal immunity from removal through legal interventions initiated by their neighbors. By the 1850s, this approach spread throughout Western Europe, Britain excluded. In Britain, reform efforts patterned after the French model were resisted throughout the first half of the 19th century as centralization incompatible with common law principles. And they were resisted, resisted not so much by the industry as by the lawyers in parliament. Nonetheless, by 1863, Britain began to create its own version of permitting under the Alkali Act with the support and encouragement of the chemical manufacturers. It would be another century before the beginnings of a national environmental permitting regime in the United States, regimes that were soon thereafter criticized as command and control. To return to the question before us, if I'm correct on the historical roots of the search for incentive-based alternatives to direct regulation in the US, what lessons does this history offer? And I can see two possible such lessons in conclusion. The first is the need for clearer separation between the economic and political normative sides of the rationale for using market instruments. This separation would in turn allow for empirical investigation into the conditions where market instruments were indeed superior to direct regulation and when it was the other way around. We need, in other words, to be prepared to take more seriously industry arguments on why a shift away from direct regulation to market instruments might not be in its interest. The second lesson I would take from this long history of division uh, is over the legitimacy of continental models is the value of regulatory formulas that are responsive to American political sensibilities. Uh, as Jason points out in his article, the acid rain program probably would not have been enacted in 1990 if it weren't for the fact that the trading regime helped create cross-cutting political support. A parallel opportunity these days can perhaps be found, though this is, uh, this is uh, not, not trading but taxes, uh, can be found in a carbon dividend plan initially proposed by former Secretary of State George Shultz and James Baker, supported by bipartisan coalition, including the Exxon Corporation. The basic outline is the fee on the emission of carbon dioxide, a dividend paid back to the American people, and immunity for industry against climbing liability lawsuits. In offering a formula for forging coalitions and bridging divides, marketable permits and other market-based instruments can indeed be a beautiful idea as the CEO of the American Electric Power Company came to believe. And so in conclusion, I want to thank Jason again for uh, really making me think about a lot of, of new ways about this issue and also uh, for posing the question that I wish we would ask much more frequently in our political debate, what can we learn from history?
Thanks for having me. It's great to be back at George Mason University. And uh, uh, now time for something completely different. So I want to talk a little bit about permits in the wireless market. So here's the magic of wireless. Uh, when a radio was invented in 1895, uh, Seems a little bit like a magic trick. And in fact, as late as 1930, the uh, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, uh, uh, Chief Justice Taft, said that he hoped that there were no radio cases coming to the court because he didn't want his uh, justices to have to dive into the law of the occult. So we're going to dive into the law of the occult and see how uh, this, this tumultuous market has, has developed with uh, tremendous uh, momentum for reform and now uh, kick back the other way. So uh, the topic of the day actually in wireless markets is 5G, fifth generation. It's supposed to be uh, better, wonderful, more of everything. I know that you were hoping for that. And um, uh, the technology adoption does rely on a permitting process, that is spectrum allocation, this uh, wireless uh, uh, invisible resource. Uh, this is traditionally conducted under command and control, public interest allocations. And traditionally, not so much now, but traditionally under very narrow specific authorizations defining what exactly can be done. And in fact, in 1927, the United States Radio Act that led the way for global policy, in fact, the first sentence of that act says, no vested claims in the ether, okay? No property rights. That's the first sentence. That's the point. We're going from a public, uh, excuse me, a private property uh, common law system to uh, administrative law. So. Uh, what's happened over time is that the uh, infirmities of that system have been widely noted and criticized, and uh, broad uh, support developed for liberalization, which in uh, this market is called flexible use, allowing the licensees, private parties that compete in the marketplace, to determine uh, what kinds of service or applications or business models uh, that, in fact, uh, can be provided and let competition be the test. In fact, there's been great progress, but every generation reconsiders property rights. And we're having a debate today over 5G policy, and there's a wonderful, wonderful split between US and Europe policy on something called the 3.5 gigahertz band that I'll talk just a little bit about. And in fact, it's interesting politically because Europe is quite liberal, and the United States I would call de registe. Uh, okay, so I've already told you about the Radio Act, uh, preempted private property rights. So we went to administrative allocation. This was in 1927. And in fact, this was a system best called cartelization because the incumbents were very much in favor of this system. In fact, the National Association of Broadcasters came up with the actual language of public interest, convenience, and necessity that was in the Act. And rigid assignments were made to do particular things, not to experiment with new technology, services, or business models. When new uh, applications came to the market or were possible, there were long delays in putting out spectrum, allowing those radios to be used. Obviously, there were anti-competitive outcomes as a result, and great innovation suppressed. A classic example being FM radio that was uh, basically killed for 30 years despite its superior performance to AM, and it sensationally involved the... Uh, uh, the, the humiliated uh, condition and the eventual suicide of the great inventor of radio in the 20th century, um, um, Edwin Howard Armstrong, professor at Columbia. Um, the intellectual and legal premise for this system of administrative control was that the market left to itself would fail. There would be a dissipation of resources, and in fact, there would be a cacophony of competing voices. Private markets could not handle this. This is a quote from the United States Supreme Court. Cacophony is misspelled. I always leave the misspelling in. <laughs> uh, so uh, famously, Ronald Coase questioned authority and said, well, you know, looking at this, it doesn't look like it's working that well. Maybe we could have a decentralized market. It wouldn't be perfect. There would be frictions. I'm not assuming that there are zero transaction costs. We're going to have to see exactly how they play out. But, you know, the current system, it's really imperfect. And maybe, maybe the alternative should be experimented with. And in fact, the way the world went over the next several decades, you know, Coase didn't make the mistake of Armstrong. He gave up, Armstrong uh, gave up on, on FM radio and the FCC when he was 63 years old, walked out an 11-story window in New York City. Coase lived to be 102. And while he was mocked and uh, ridiculed with his suggestions in 1959 and 1960, he lived long enough to see that the world went from the status of FM being suppressed for 30 years to another technology needing radio spectrum where the inventors circa 2005 
actually went to the marketplace and could make contracts to use radio spectrum for their radio. They, in fact, played the carriers with liberal de facto property rights over defined spaces uh, in, in the electromagnetic spectrum, and they got the carriers to, to bid against each other for access to this wonderful new technology. In the event, by the way, uh, Apple paid a negative price for access to radio spectrum. They were paid because of their uh, iconic contributions to consumer welfare. After this, an entirely new world of complexity opens up that could never be imagined by the administrative allocation system. All of these millions, and I do mean millions, literally of apps on competing uh, ecosystems now, all of them compete, excuse me, interfere with one another. They compete for radio space. And the complexity of that kind of a system is literally unfathomable under the administrative allocation system. Now, what I've just told you is not controversial in uh, regulatory circles in the United States and other countries. However, there is a challenge that is controversial and uh, I think uh, self-consciously hopes to be in a new book by um, uh, law and economics uh, scholars uh, Eric Posner and Andrew uh, Whale. And in Radical Markets, which is making some waves, they assert that COSA's results really are just a theoretical special case, the idea that markets can handle uh, something as complicated as radio spectrum. And in fact, when you look at how spectrum markets have performed, they say that, in fact, they have frozen. Because of transaction costs and monopoly uh, holdups, they have frozen allocations in the old technologies and denied them for the new. And in fact, auctions for internet advertising work so much better than auctions in the spectrum market. A related paper uh, by one of the authors uh, says that, in fact, a recent 2017, 2016, 2017 auction held by the FCC where TV stations were paid to go off the air and then the spectrum taken, allocated to new liberal flexible use licenses and purchased by wireless carriers for mobile. It says this recent FCC incentive auction highlights how long renewable licenses, in this case for TV broadcast, have sometimes delayed changes and incurred huge costs. Well, full stop. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> there, there, there's a very explicit legal reason why the television band is today, uh, uh, as allocated in 1952, still the television band, and that is because those licenses do not permit a change of use. And this is from, uh, there are many, many, many sources. I'll give you a good book on this that was published last year. But, but here's another good book published a decade ago by Michael Heller, professor at Columbia Law School. Uh, the second paragraph is of some interest. Uh, he's talking about TV stations that uh, were given new digital licenses. Um, and it says uh, even if they were due some compensation, it wouldn't need to be in spectrum limited to over-the-air digital broadcast. That is to say there's only one business model. There is only one technology. There is only one transmission system allowed for over-the-air broadcast TV licensees. There is no change of use. It is not a spectrum permit. It is not a property right to use radio waves as competitive market conditions uh, or the licensee would insist. Now, despite the fact that that, that that is in the middle of this regulatory system, the FCC did not, did, not, did not make the switch to overcome market problems, but to get away from political problems within the non-market failure of holding up new technologies by a 1952 allocation. The other side is that massive aggregations have put together, together efficient configurations of uh, these shards of property rights that have, have come into the market in the United States, uniquely in the United States, by the way. This is just a count, a recent count from the Federal Communications Commission as to how many actual wireless, mobile wireless licenses the major carriers in the United States hold. It's over 60,000. I'm, I'm fairly positive it's a, it's, it's a miscount. It's much, much higher than that. Uh, the FCC doesn't know exactly how many licenses the carriers hold, uh, which is something to ponder right there. But the fact <laughs> of the matter is that there are four national carriers. And the FCC has issued well over 60,000 licenses that have had to be put together almost entirely in secondary market transactions. Now, putting those efficient aggregations of spectrum together is the tip of the iceberg. What's really happening is a lot of vertical integration where networks and spectrum are held together. This enables the world of wireless, hundreds of millions of subscribers, thousands of devices, hundreds of thousands of applications. All that we get over the air now 
in these uh, amazing innovation ecosystems and the emerging Internet of Things and these wholesale networks, all kinds of transactions, and even the technology upgrades, 1G, 2G, 3G, now to go to 5G, fifth generation wireless, this operates in a very liberal space. It could not possibly be designed by administrative allocation. And in fact, one of the arguments made for how well the FCC did was that they managed the interference between the TV stations and how complex a task that was. This is a 2017 paper that deals a lot with the computer science of actually moving these TV stations around and making sure that you mitigate interference. And in fact, there's uh, 2.7 million pairwise constraints just in the TV world. Very interesting that this would be an advertisement for government regulation of this market over the marketable permit scheme. In fact, this is phantom interference. This is over-the-air broadcast. This is uh, I Love Lucy. This is a technology that's been bypassed by at least two generations of transmission platform technology, first being cable, second being satellite, and now we're into the next, which is over-the-top uh, over uh, online broadband. So this is phantom interference. This is where the regulators have concentrated. As we stand here today and beyond 2020, we will have 35 over-the-air TV channels. Nobody's watching this stuff. Nobody has to watch this stuff. It was great back in the day. It did uh, deliver something of value. Uh, it way over-allocated, went too long, was rigid. The marketable allocations uh, that have come in into some parts of the market have not cleared out and haven't been extended to the television market. And so the complexity that we see it's absolutely clear from the TV uh, example and from the other markets that are going that all of these applications in this space, millions of customers, millions of applications, are able to, to, to actually coordinate through market competition and a relaxation. Now, this is being challenged, and I'll just mention this. The, the, the test today is that for new 5G technologies, there's a a ban that the entire world is putting out into the marketplace. It's called 3.5 gigahertz. And the United States has a very complicated scheme. Uh, I won't go through it now because I'm out of time. But I will just note in this one uh, chart, which is too much text, but uh, the US is at the very bottom. These other European countries are already putting out broad liberal swaths of spectrum, putting it in the hands of three or four national carriers getting services introduced to the market, the United States has a much more complicated scheme where it's having much smaller, more fragmentary rights and much more political uh, jockeying. Uh, there is no, there, there actually was a proceeding that just was voted yesterday by the Federal Communications Commission by, by chance. And um, it's gonna take a long time to get very little spectrum out of the marketplace. And um, in fact, in Europe, you're seeing headlines like this. Uh, Spain puts out these broad, mar uh, marketable swaths of, uh, of radio waves, and you're going to get a launch soon. Um, you're not getting that in the United States, and I predict that you won't see it for a long time. But it's a great comparative economics uh, experiment. It's a, a dissertation topic I would recommend to your students. And um, I, I know what the answer is because I've already seen what's happened in a very parallel proceeding called the TV white spaces, which uh, theoretically works to share on government rules. And in fact, um, is, it can be compared to what we see for 300 million customers using that liberal uh, property rights regime and mobile versus the absolute failure of these TV white spaces to share TV band spectrum under government sharing rules. And uh, that's it. Uh, we're about to uh, come to the question period, but I did want to um, sort of open a new front on the issue of marketable permits, etc., market mimicking devices to speak broadly. The focus, uh, the affirmative focus, has been overwhelmingly on efficiency, uh, assuring that actors have continuous, ongoing incentives to do better. Uh, and therefore to and compete against each other, really, to most efficiently meet the standards, usually environmental. Uh, I'm all for that. Uh, and, I, and I also recognize the, the downside. But what I, what I want to talk about is sort of the political economy, an aspect of the political economy, which Nega raised. Um, and that is that um, the, uh, many of the command and control things uh, set uh, 
parties against each other really quite unnecessarily. Uh, and I'm thinking particularly of the new source performance standards, which apply to uh, an old plant that the owner wants to improve. And actually, sometimes the improvement that the owner actually wants improves environmental conditions, but it also is a major change. If it's pronounced a major change, then a slew of additional regulations apply. So we, what you have is uh, usually uh, power plants uh, locked in combat with environmentalists. Uh, and both of them seem, in a way, right. Uh, the environmentalists are saying, look, this is an old plant. Uh, but for these rules, you would have discarded it long ago uh, and uh, put in a, a more efficient plant and a plant that meets environmental standards much better. Uh, but because of, of you tend to blame the, the operator because of your persistence. Uh, <coughs> you're going to keep this old plant operating on old-fashioned rules uh, while there's, there's a better alternative. The plant owner says, well, you know, Congress has set up these rules. As long as our change is not major, we can do it. Under these rules, it would be wasteful and expensive uh, for us to uh, make, to, to treat it as a major change. So we're going to fight all the way on that classification. With a, uh, I think it would work, I think with uh, taxes, with cap and trade, probably most of the splendid list that uh, Jason laid out at the beginning, all that could be avoided. The uh, owner of the plant would have an incentive to choose between uh, continued emissions and putting on things that improve matters uh, and would be paid, would, would get benefit for the uh, positive environmental changes that it made. Um, so the, it, it's interesting, I don't know if you've read Steven Pinker's wonderful book, um, uh, name's escaping me, um, The Better Angels. Uh, and he uh, refers to le du commerce, French phrase, in contrast with their dirisisme, uh, and that is the recognition that commerce, the ability to trade between people, people getting rich through trade, rather than people getting rich through assault, capture, so forth, uh, use of government as a bludgeon, whatnot, um, essentially makes for a more peaceful and harmonious uh, society. The du commerce, sweet commerce. So uh, when you think of the de registre French government, besides looking at Tom's wonderful example of how uh, it is outpacing uh, America's uh, supposedly liberal viewpoint, uh, think of the du commerce and, and the ways in which these market mimicking devices can uh, move us in that direction. So now we're ready for questions. I guess um, if people have, have brief, if pa panelists have brief additions they'd like to make, we could start with them, but uh, otherwise go to the You're the man of the hour, do you want to? Um, I, I, I would just like to, to thank um, my fellow panelists for, um, for their feedback. Um, it's given me a lot to think about, but I'm more interested to get the questions from, from the audience. Yes. I think I have a uh, microphone is coming to you. Hi. Uh, so, Jason, I haven't read your paper yet, but I'm very excited to read it. Uh, I had a comment uh, that you, maybe you cover or not. But um, so this DOE's request for information, so that came out about a year ago, November 2017. And um, kind of jumping off of Judge Williams' point, too, the political economy of this. So might it be that the reason that industry is not on board with, the uh, with this flexibility in the standards is that there is an alternative, that maybe Congress is more sympathetic to loosening the whole statutory regime, and that, m that might be their strategy going forward. So don't put Trump administration, don't go this route, 
help us go this route. Uh, so it, have you seen anything about lobbying for something like that? Is there a movement underway for that? And could that explain some of this? Um, I've not seen anything about a lobbying uh, Congress. Um, I've not looked for it. That, that would be interesting to, to look for. I, I have seen um, some of the same commenters um, pitching other ideas to the Department of Energy, um, other ways to, um, to reform the standards. Um, and, and I do think, um, even though they don't say it in so many words, that this is possibly one of their unstated motives for opposing this particular type of flexibility um, is that they're focused on other things um, and um, they just can't, um, you know, they have to, to prioritize. Um, you know, actually, um, in, in one of uh, Tom's papers um, on why um, the industry eventually um, gave way to um, auctions in the spectrum context, um, Tom posits that one of the reasons is that the industry had just gotten a, a pretty good deal but it required them to do a lot of other work with the agency. They, they now needed um, favorable regulations that to come out of the good deal that Congress gave them. And they were so focused on that that they just didn't have the, the yeah, bandwidth would, yeah. um, to oppose the auction. And so they sort of relented. Um, and so definitely, you know, different priorities could come into play here. Yes. <clears throat> I was hoping, Professor, in your <clears throat> list of unwarranted assumptions, <clears throat> excuse me, the example of taking our cars to meet cafe standards, turning them into plastic tinker toys, uh, the number of killings and maimings that have occurred because our cars are no longer as safe in collisions. Comment. It's, it's just another example of a trade-off, right? And when we focus on one yeah. and we set that as the legal obligation, there may be a tendency to overlook, discount entirely even some of these other uh, aspects, uh, other values uh, that, that we care about. Yes. I have a question uh, uh, to the panel not based on any legal or economic analysis, but on some work analysis. Years ago, many years ago, I was a buyer for household products for a major uh, department, department chain. And then later in that in life, I became a designer for heat exchangers for chemical plants. And when I compare the two products that you looked at, it seems to me that if you want to judge why industry opposes these based on your analysis. It seems to me that the regulatory regime has bestowed a huge economic rent on the producers of, of retail products subject to this rule, which don't exist when you look at industrial components of, like a heat exchanger and a scrubber. Because when my experience with the people that built those, and when I bought those, those uh, household appliances, they're an integral part of the product is how it looks and little changes in the technology of what it performs. And the people that buy those are very, very cognizant of that. And I don't see that in the heat exchanger business or the scrubber business. So I think, the, I think there's a possibility you might explore that the, econ that the regulatory regime has bestowed these economic rents to such a degree on those type of products versus producer products that the industry doesn't want to change. Yeah, there, there's definitely a different level of coverage um, for residential appliances versus commercial and then industrial um, are, are sort of the, the least covered right now. Um, and, you know, in, in the the Department of Energy's proposal, um, you know, they raise a, a, a number of different options how a market could work. You could have, you know, just trading sort of within lines of, of products. Um, you could have trading between, you know, so maybe, you know, only, you know, washer dryers can trade with other washer dryers. Maybe washer dryers can also trade with residential refrigerators. Maybe they can trade with industrial. 
Um, you know, there are a variety of different ways to, to structure it. Um, and you would think that maybe different segments of industry would have different things to gain or lose from various, various structures. Um, and um, I at least didn't see a lot of exploration of, um, you know, from really anybody um, uh, about, you know, maybe there's a way to, to set this up that would, you know, benefit a particular segment of industry um, or, or, or maybe not. Um, so, um, you know, given sort of the diversity in the industry, um, I was a little surprised to see a relative lack of diversity in, in, in the reactions. Um, but I, I think that is something I should look closer at, is, is the, the differences between manufacturers focus more on residential versus, versus industrial. Uh, David Zaring. Um, so this is, uh, I'm just trying to, this may sound like it's a sort of naive question, but I don't see um, industry itself trying to provide or create these sorts of markets. Um, and I understand that one of the reasons for that is they aren't particularly interested in sort of environmental compliance unless, unless they're made to do it. Um, but does that sort of surprise you that there's no effort to um, sort of create a sort of um, private sector market that would, um, you know, uh, uh, allow companies to get to some sort of standards, even industry-imposed standards. Um, uh, and if uh, there isn't something like that out there, I mean, what do you make of that uh, lacuna? Um, I mean, there have there have been in, in other contexts um, some sort of voluntary offset markets, um, in, in particular for, for carbon, um, where there was the voluntary creation um, uh, on a Chicago trade exchange of, of these offset credits that could be traded and, and then could be sold, um, all sort of on a voluntary basis for um, companies that, that wanted to claim, oh, we're you know, carbon neutral because we've bought all these credits. Um, and so there, there have been. Um, you know, some examples of, of sort of voluntary schemes that, that sort of mimic some, some of these um, market-based um, approaches. Um, you know, why something like that hasn't um, developed in, in, in this context? Um, it's not something that I've, I've specifically looked at yet. Um, you know, there are some voluntary industry standards. I, I mentioned this, the set-top boxes. Um, there are some programs where um, appliance efficiency and equipment efficiency um, has sort of been voluntarily incorporated into um, maybe a state or a country has um, a renewable electricity portfolio standard where utilities are required to either buy renewable energy or reduce demand or some combination. Um, and sometimes um, appliance efficiency gets brought into that mix um, where you know, you'll have a utility you know, um, paying people to, to buy more efficient water heaters and, and refrigerators, and they get to count that as a, as a credit um, towards their um, uh, obligations. Um, but but that, that is really sort of distinct from you know, this, this regulatory regime. Um, and um, I've sort of rambled around your question a, a, a bit now, um, which, which is to say, I, it's not something I've specifically looked at, and so I don't know that I have, have a great answer. Is, isn't part of the answer the, the market itself? I mean, we're talking about market-based regulatory instruments, but, but the choice about how to design a regulatory system is embedded in this larger competitive marketplace. And voluntary approaches just in general are uh, to the extent that they are, have some companies incurring, internalizing some externalities voluntarily that puts them at a competitive disadvantage to their, their peers. And then when it comes to thinking about market-based instruments as well, whether voluntary or regulatory, at least in my experience, having worked uh, with, um, in, the, in the 
with in the private sector with uh, companies around the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, where in addition to the sulfur dioxide provisions that actually, the trading provisions that actually found their way into the 90 Clean Air Act, there were actually some proposals for uh, automobile emissions trading at that time too. And I know that the automakers were asking themselves, well, will this, will we do better than our competitors in, if we go down that route? And, you know, I think the U.S. car companies were probably a little worried. At that time, they had a bigger market share. Uh, they were worried about the foreign car makers having smaller cars and maybe being able to do better with them, having to, uh, having to buy credits from, uh, you know, foreign automakers just didn't sit well. And I suspect maybe the foreign car companies wondered, gee, you know, this would actually relatively advantage these larger U.S. car companies that have these larger fleets and, you know, they, and, a, and a broader mix of cars, like the advantages from, from the flexibility might in, inhere more to the, the companies that have a heter more heterogeneous mix. So I, 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 I suspect that kind of thinking is going on in every one of these markets. Not, not only, uh, you know, am I going to tie my own hands behind my back with a voluntary commitment to incur costs that I otherwise wouldn't have to, but if I also then shift to a market-based approach, how am I going to fare under that market-based regulatory system vis-a-vis -vis my competitors? Could, could I just ask about the monitoring on the, uh, I don't know about the Chicago Board of Trade carbon offsets, but maybe somebody wants to, I'm, I'm asking a question about it. I mean, obviously, if you're selling a carbon offset, there's some certification that, the, that has to be part of that package, and, and uh, I, I don't know if that's a regulatory function, although it, uh, on reflex it seems to be. Um, now, also with monitoring, and uh, j just to tie everything together, 5G networks will have Uber monitoring everywhere. This is, <laughs> in other contexts, a big issue. But um, here, here it's an opportunity, certainly, for uh, more uh, efficiency and uh, certainly more market-based efficiency because monitoring is getting so much de decentralized and, and cheap and, and ubiquitous. It is. Do, do, do you, the people on the panel or anybody else want to answer? The Chicago um, carbon, carbon um, credits were, were I think monitoring in general with these voluntary initiatives is a persistent challenge. It's a big challenge with non-voluntary <laughs> regulation. Too. Right. But I think I think your point about the advantage, you know, just of new sensor technologies, Internet of Things, and we may well see that that provides us much greater opportunities for monitoring that could could facilitate more sure. market-based. Sure. And approaches. you can have an official system yeah. and then crowdsource. Yeah, the monitoring of the monitors, which obviously is another uh, efficiency in, in term, terms mm -hmm. of decentralizing that. So, um, humor me. I have two questions. Um, first, you know, as an Iowan, I spend most of my waking hours thinking about ethanol, and um, <laughs> obviously the EPA. Uh, they, for right. <laughs> the, the, the EPA, you know, they, they they constructed a market of sorts with the Renewable Fuels Credit Program. And they created the, the RINs, renewable identification numbers, to track all these gallons of, of biofuel that were being blended into gasoline. And then there were real questions about how well the market was working, how well it was constructed. And at one point, the EPA signed an MOU with the CFTC, hoping to sort of borrow or rely on the CFTC's expertise in markets um, in constructing their own. And so I guess my first question is, when any one agency is thinking about building a, some sort of marketable permitting scheme, um, to what extent should they home grow it and to what extent should they rely on the expertise in other agencies or maybe even is this something, you know, the White House's uh, OIRA should oversee across all agencies. I'm curious about that. And my second question, and that's for everybody, and my second question also for everybody, but first and foremost for Tom since he brought it up, you, know, you said in your presentation, Tom, you, you started by saying the FCC, uh, you know, the Radio Act of 27 stressed that these licenses are not there's no property right. And then in a later slide, you said, well, now we have sort of de facto ownership. And I, that's such a hotly contested topic. And I'm curious if that's something, I'd be interested in everybody's thoughts, is that difference between real property rights and something short of property rights, is that something that can be kind of smoothed away? Or is that something what, as we move to more and more marketable permit arrangements, we really need to grapple with directly 
the property rights uh, and interests in these licenses? Um, so I, I can uh, address the, the first part of the question first um, in a bit of a, a self-serving way. So I was uh, the consultant to the Administrative Conference of the United States on their recommendations on marketable permits. And the recommendations um, included um, language that encouraged agencies to look to the experiences uh, of others and um, to rely on the expertise of others, um, in, in particular, um, the expertise of the CFTC is, is relevant when um, these markets become so complex that you have um, derivatives. Um, but, but even um, in the case of, of just sort of secondary trading, um, you know, it, the, there are monitoring challenges. Um, you know, the agencies um, ha have not um, always set up their, their markets in the most um, efficient and transparent ways. There are problems with price discovery and, and other things. Um, right now, even as we speak, the EPA and Department of Transportation are calling for comments on um, their CAFE standards and the markets there and whether there should, for the first time, be um, disclosure of, of prices there to, to aid in price discovery and to help the public understand what is actually being traded and to monitor that. Um, and e even to help the agencies. The agencies don't even know um, what prices these these credits are, are being traded at? They they have guesses, but um, so um, so the, the the recommendations from ACUS are, are certainly um, you know to not reinvent the wheel um, every time. Um, but at the same time, I, I think you know I, I don't know how eager the CFTC is um, to be stretched over all of these potential um, marketable permits. Um, so I think there's, there's a challenge there. John, on the second question? Yeah, so there has been explicit uh, deregulation, if you will, or liberalization is a better term, uh, under the uh, standard that uh, you, no private party can assert a vested claim uh, to the use of a frequency. Uh, regulators have, uh, using the terminology flexible use, have uh, expanded de facto property rights. And so under administrative law, you have had, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, this li very pronounced liberalization. And um, of course, it's, it's case by case, and it's slow and plotting, and most, you know, the vast majority, in fact, of spectrum is still regulated under legacy rules. And so that's why when we turn to the next generation, you know, what about this liberalization? Well, because we still have command and control for the new allocations that are being made available, you have to apply new liberal rules. And so, um, you know, that's what's on the table. And in that, the rent seeking creeps in and you do have this interest group warfare. Some ideology comes in as well. And, uh, and, and you get things like now the split between the United States and, and Europe, where we have uh, just remarkably different uh, approaches in the way we're, we're uh, recognizing these property rights. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, the Europeans are, uh, are much more liberal on this. So we have, I think we have a, a nice market test of those alternative approaches. So you've got a yeah. mic for it. Good morning, Patrick Littlefield. Very interesting discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll go to the Internet of Things. Um, and one of the arenas that uh, there's a, a fair amount of concern in the national security space is that uh, the retail devices that are increasingly kind of incumbents on the Internet uh, have uh, in, inadequate security, that we as a nation are vulnerable. So the question to the panel is, what do you see kind of in terms of emerging regulatory interest in what I'll call the public good of national security across the the public highways, the internet, uh, and how might marketable permits be used to, to stimulate or improve our performance in that area? <laughs> I, I mean, I, th I mean, when you're dealing with security uh, in general, and, and I think this applies also to cybersecurity as well, it's a, it's a much more uh, challenge. I mean, it's challenging in so many ways uh, uh, to regulate. Um, the uh, part of it is because the problem is dynamic. The, there's a, you know, you can patch one 
hole and, 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 the, and the smart enemy is going to find another, right? So that's one thing. You've got the dynamism. You also have, it seems to me, a, uh, a, a different shape of the benefit curve for, for regulation. I mean, typically, in, in, say, in environmental regulation, if we eliminate 90% of the pollution, we get a l probably most of the benefits, right? If we eliminate 90% of the security uh, holes or flaws, still have probably get zero benefits, right? So I, th I think the, the, the challenge of regulating in this area is, uh, is just qualitatively uh, more, more difficult than in any other space. And I suspect that because market-based instruments require a, a degree of monitoring, it's, uh, and that's what they rely on, that, that, that's only going to make th that even harder in an area like this. I mean, how does one assess uh, how well someone is doing? You know, you have a cybersecurity credits that I can, some devices can be more secure from, from hazards and some can be less. Uh, you know, it, so I, I think the, the, the complexities are fundamental in the nature of the problem. Uh, the dynamic uh, nature of the problem, the shape of the benefit curve from regulating. Uh, and then you throw on a, a, a market-based approach uh, that I think uh, doesn't solve those and it may actually exacerbate, make things even more complex. Yeah, a, a market approach um, works best when what you're trading is, is fungible. So that's why a lot of people think that so that the best case is greenhouse gas emissions because it's a global pollutant. It does not matter which source where in the world is emitting or reducing. What matters is, is the total level uh, of emissions. Um, there are other things that we would probably never want to um, allow to be traded, like medical licenses, um, because they, you know, you want to make sure that the who is holding that is is meeting all of the. Um, all of the criteria, um, and I think you know that's an, another way of, of, of stating Kerry's point about the the ninety ten. Um, you know, the the ten percent in, in the security area is still a, re a real problem. Um, you know, I have not thought for any longer than these few minutes since you posed the question uh, about this, but it would be interesting to think about whether there is a performance based approach to security that could work versus a, a means based something like. You know, we're going to have you know a, a hackathon every six months, and as long as you know nobody can hack into your system, we don't care how you did it, so long as you know you you pass that test or something like that. Um, but I'm not sure how a marketable approach. Is. Air, airport screenings actually are evaluated that way. The airport security, we actually have mm -hmm. you know government folks who try to get their way through, and then we evaluate how well we're doing the security that way. Yeah, just to be orthogonal, um, I, I, you know, the, the, the you know the thing obviously we can agree on is this is a very hard problem, and uh, it, it, it takes rules that are unusual, uh, liability rules, uh, the ability to collaborate despite antitrust rules across uh, industry co competitors, and of course collaborate with private and, and public actors to share information. Uh, there has to be, and there is obviously a lot of action moving there. Right now, we we deal with the problem very much in terms of a competitive market. Uh, the brand names of corporations we deal with are on the line in security breaches, and they spend lots of money quite effectively relative to the alternatives in uh, protecting their systems. Now, we obviously hear about breaches and hear about the problems, and we should, and they have very large effects on capital values of major firms who we, who we know, and they should. And right now, we are hearing uh, you know, publicly from Tim Cook at Apple, uh, who is aggressively taking the position that all the other companies in his space are terrible and breach your privacy. Uh, 
and Apple will never do that. And, you know, to which I actually heard uh, CNBC anchors uh, a few weeks ago smirk. Well, of course not. They already got your money. <laughs> Apple takes all your money when they give you the phone. Facebook and Google, you know, they, they give, give everything away for free and come back with, with uh, you know, the privacy compromise. So there are actors out there that are doing this. The flip side of it, uh, this guy, I think it's David Sanger's uh, book, um, uh, The Perfect Weapon. I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, it's, it's, it's quite something. It's, it's one of those things you, you actually hate reading it because, you know, every story is worse than the previous one. But, um, you know, the, the compromise on this is, is uh, you know, the inherent compromise is that the, the U.S. government is on both sides of the cyber terrorism issue. And we are an offensive uh, player and a defensive player. And, um, you know, there's just no question we're, you know, we, we, we are conflicted into how we deal with these kinds of issues. Um, and in fact, in terms of security breaches, uh, it, it's hard to come up with something worse than, than the, you know, the Chinese government hack of, of U.S. federal employees that, that occurred 2015, 2016, when, when U.S. data was left for, for 22 million U.S. federal workers, was left on unencrypted on uh, Department of Interior computer servers. And the reason they were used is because they were just... Uh, it was just vacant space. They had they had available disk space, and it was not particularly state of the art situation. But they, you know, this seemed to be an efficient uh, allocation of uh, Department of Interior computers. And in fact, the uh, Chinese hackers came in, and they poked around for about a year undetected. And then, when they decided to actually suck the data out in mass. They encrypted the data on the way out because they didn't want the American authorities to actually know what they were doing. Uh, at that point, uh, you know, uh, we found out after four million of the 22 million apparently had extreme uh, security breaches in terms of their medical records and social security numbers and so forth, uh, going to the Chinese government. Re uh, one of the reasons U.S. security uh, authorities uh, understand that it was the Chinese government is that none of the data has appeared on black markets. So I tell my friends who work for the government, don't worry, the Chinese government has it and they'll take care of it now. It's, it's, it's fine, you're, you're okay. But uh, private actors would presumably sell the data. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the state actors, obviously they have, they face the same challenges and they're in a, in a, in a different, uh, you, know, uh, you know, funding and incentive structure. And, and some of these things just completely get, you know, get beyond their, their grasp. And, and so it's, it's a rocky road all the way around. I see Adam about to close us down, but I, I did want to close uh, by quoting uh, Aaron Waldowski, who's been dead for 20 years, I don't know, a long time. Uh, but I left him, and then we walked around the courthouse a bit, and I remember one line of his, you can ruin a country just as thoroughly with market mimicking devices as by command and control. <laughs> it all depends on the numbers. Thank you. Wow. Well, on that cheery note, um, I do want to say this is such a wide and, 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 and rich subject that we're, we're very grateful for all of our speakers' contributions on this, and especially grateful for Jason's paper building on his work for ACUS. A theme running through today's conference is that the paper that Jason wrote is available on our website in its current draft format. And I hope that when it's published, uh, it attracts a lot of attention and further discussion. Uh, but in the meantime, please join me so much in thanking uh, all five of our speakers. <laughs>